This week we talk Atlantic salmon, golden dorado, peacock bass. We talk tackle and techniques. We talk exotic fisheries, the mighty Amazon, the Uruguay River and the iconic Moy fishery. We talk to adventure angler Patrick Brown, Australian lure maker Luke Chammings and our studio guest is Stuart Price of the Mount Falcon Estate. Welcome to another fishtalk.tv, the weekly live online show for all of you fish heads out there. I'm here now in Crooked Wood broadcasting around the world and my guest this week is Stuart Price who's the fishery manager at the iconic Mount Falcon Estates on the River Moy in the west of Ireland in County Mayo. Stuart, you're very welcome to Fish Talk. Thank you very much for inviting me on Alan. Now I know you have a love affair with salmon. Salmon would be my, my passion. I fished as a small boy for all species, but once you... My father was a big salmon fisherman, very keen salmon fisherman, and indeed uh, his father. So it was in the blood, and once you'd caught the salmon, then the other species seemed to drift away a little. But it wasn't always like that. You cut your teeth on the coarse fishing species, as they say. Uh, I did. I mean, we fished uh, regularly the Hampshire Avon uh, down uh, near... from runs out at Christchurch, but we used to fish up at Bremer above uh, Ringwood. I uh, had a Sunday rod there, and that was, uh, I would catch chub. I remember uh, also catching uh, some quite large perch, you know, lying on a bridge, looking down, seeing large perch. Um, wow. And th those were the days when I was sort of almost not allowed to fish for salmon <laughs> when I was young. I think the fear was I'd, I'd hook one and, uh, and, and, and mess it up. So uh, uh, as I progressed then on, on to salmon fishing, I, I think it's, I always say that salmon's my drug, if you like. Other people, it might be pike or carp or yeah. It's a wonderful thing because, you know, the viewers know now that I, I, back in the day I was in aquaculture and I also had a love affair with growing salmon, the baby fish. That was my big thing, the little fish hatching mm. them out. But to grow salmon is one thing, but to pursue wild salmon now, that to me yeah. is a fabulous thing. I fish for them in a few countries, but I've never really put my mind to it in Ireland. That's something I'm putting to rights. Yeah. Well, you should come down to... Uh, and join us at Mount Falcon because certainly the, the moy for us is a, a, a great salmon river, you know, very prolific. Now your grandfather, he was a keen angler. Yeah, my grandfather, they, uh, they lived uh, in Wales uh, and they used to fish some of the Welsh rivers and uh, we indeed went on holiday as, as, uh, as a small boy we used to go to fish the, the Typhi. So we'd have the family holiday on the beach in the day and then the evenings we'd fish for salmon and then at night for the sea trout. Idyllic. Yeah. Uh, and I remember that very, very well, catching my first sea trout, which was probably only eight or ten ounces, you know. Wow. But and, and when would you have caught it on the fly? Your first salmon or sea trout, say a big one on the fly? Uh, I progressed in terms of our, our early fishing. The Hampshire Avon was very much uh, early season for the three sea winter fish. Would have been a fair bit of Devon minnow fishing, so the, the spinning. Uh, Paternoster lead and a floating Devon. Uh, and then upstream meps would have become popular yeah. maybe May or June. And, and in those days also, you know, I'm talking about the 70s, 80s, would have done a fair bit of bait worming at times as well. So my fly fishing came much later. Uh, and I probably caught my first salmon on the fly uh, not until my mid-20s, I would say. Something ar around that. So uh, I, I very much did the apprenticeship, which I, I, I encourage people to do, is to go through the methods understand a bit about the, the river. And the finesse and the that's required when you're pursuing these different species. Yeah, I think for us, the thing that I still love today is going back, I usually get back maybe once a year to those chalk streams the, in Hampshire, the Lower Test, Lower Rich in Hampshire Avon, and you can, you can see the salmon with the Polaroids. And for me, that's a huge excitement. It's, it's a great yeah. adrenaline buzz once you can see the fish. Yeah, and I suppose fish. you're probably like me and most anglers, when you go to a bridge, you get on the parapet, oh, yeah, yeah. you must yeah. stop yeah, yeah. and peer in. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm a great one for trying to, trying, to, <laughs> trying to see fish wherever I can, you know, I think it's just in you isn't it yeah, yeah. now yeah. have you had any what i would call red letter days when you've been out with the fly that everything seemed to just turn on and it's like as if every salmon was tuned into whatever your offering was I, I've, I've been fortunate in as much as in the last nine seasons you know i've been the fishery manager on mount falcon we have two miles of the moy and when the conditions are right then I, i'm there if you like so certainly if you go back to 2010 which was a very prolific river We'd have had days where I, I tend to stop now. If I catch two or three fish, I stop. But um, 
certainly guess wise there have been days where we would caught 20 or 30 fish on the 20 fly. Yeah. 30 salmon yeah, per in rod the, in on the, the fly. well no between between the guests okay, between maybe many, many. half a dozen guests well, that's you know. five or six ahead yeah that's yeah and, and obviously you're connecting a lot of fish now they, okay. they're exceptional days you know okay. that's that's not a yes, yeah. I, I always say any day that you catch a salmon is a is a very good day you yes know? yeah and and if you set your sights around that then you you're not doing badly are yes you? exactly yeah anybody that now folks salmon. Stuart is our guest in studio tonight and we'll be staying with us throughout the program but up next I was out recently but our good friend Pascal Briso and his shore snacks really give me something to roan and groan about because my stomach was groaning and moaning yesterday have a look at this, what he had in store for me. Today, we yes. will do uh, a special dish. Special? Yes. Is, uh, are they not all special? Because they are, they're fantastic. That will be a chili con chiqui. Chicken. Chili con, con chiqui. chiqui. Yes. Chili con chiqui. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> Can we start? Well, yeah. Okay, we Absolutely. Go. This sounds wonderful. Ah, we get some butter. Nice butter. Yes. Chunks of butter in. Hot yeah, pan. A little bit in a hot pan. Okay. Your chicken already cooked. Oh wow! Well. Yeah, lovely chunks of chicken. Yes. Yeah. To make quick. To so that's just from your roasted chicken you might have in the fridge from in the Sunday fridge. or whatever. Completely, yeah. Lovely. Pascal, today you're using butter now. Yes, butter. Oh, why not yeah. olive oil? Because to give a softness to the sauce oh, on the rice. I love the way you that's say that. That's very important. That's lovely. Yeah. So it's browning up very nicely in the butter. Butter, yes. I'll give you a good And how taste. long will you cook this for now? Oh, but less than two minutes. Two minutes. And it's safe. We've discussed this before. It's Completely. already pre-cooked, but it's we're only doing a reheat job for the first time. So yes, there's no that's problem. It. It's no problem about health and safety yeah. or no for the, of course not. It looks lovely. Hello. We have to add some the salt. lovely salt and pepper and mix, pepper. already pre-mixed. Yes, look, very, sm even that smells very nice. That's wonderful. Actually, yes, there's a bit of cinnamon. Spice. Yes, there's cinnamon. Yes. yes, there is. Cinnamon, coriander, is salt and all that. Unbelievable. Already. Unbelievable. Pascal, this is terrific, yeah. Here, and it's yeah. so simple, what? We're a minute into a minute and a half. Completely. Oh, look, nice so we're now girl. into turmeric. So, uh, no, chili. Ch oh, chi chili, chili. Oh, wow, chili. Don't put too much because no, it will no. be very hot. Just in right? case. Yes. The boys have very delicate stomachs. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they tend to complain a lot. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you see there. Oh, lovely colour now coming into it. That will add that. I'll give it a little bite. Pascal, I can smell the, the chilli. It gives it a nice colour, but it's going to give it a slight bite. A slight bite, yeah. Slight bite to it. With the weather like today, it would be good, you know, to yes, yeah. And our get crew, our crew are a bit weak. They like to be warmed up, don't exactly. they? Exactly. Yeah, that way we will yeah. do that. So you're a very, very agreeable fellow. Oh, the white wine, lovely. What wine? Oh, Sauvignon Blanc. From New Zealand. From New Zealand. Yeah, our friends are all black. All black. You know, They're all black rugby, rugby fellows. Yes, we will get them. Now, there. how much will we put in here? Oh, uh, small glass. Uh, small glass. Uh, small glass. Small glass. Okay. This is nice. Oh, why are you using that? Why are you putting Sauvignon Blanc in, in with this? Uh, but it's to uh, to take off all the you see the bits to I do, do the nice sauce. Yes, yes. You see, they're already uh, oh, mixed. Already. Mixed. Oh, you have the butter, the chili, the juice of the chicken. Yes. Coming up. In the sauce. So you're making a lovely, lovely juice now. Yeah. And it's reducing already. Exactly. And in France, that. we call that déglacé. Déglacé. Yeah, you, you want uh, the, the, uh, the uh, suc in, in the sauce. Okay. Déglacé. Voilà. I'll get my spoon. Yeah, yeah, the, the wine, Sorry. the actual sort of clouds of, of, of uh, aromas arising out of us. Yeah, it's I'll gorgeous. Make, make sure all the alcohol is down because maybe you have few children one day <laughs> and we have to be careful with that yeah i don't think oh, i mind though too much that's not me ready <laughs> it's reducing nicely yes all you use so we got you can uh, well we do that uh, you so know, this is a mix of yours prepared yes what prepared. That? it's a tomato sauce with some onions uh, yes. pepper on uh, some um, uh, red uh, beans red beans okay yes. like kidney beans Exactly. And, and, and can you buy something like this prepared? Yeah, you, you can see, uh, buy that all prepared in any shop. Oh, so we just show to the folks. Yeah, exactly. That's all it is. Very nice. Lovely colour. Yes. Hello. You have different, uh, you have very spicy or less spicy, depending okay. on the way you like it. And what's this one? Uh, half. Oh, I knew <laughs> I, I didn't want to be too mean <laughs> with you. <laughs> you're, being, you're being diplomatic as well. Oh, ever. yeah, yeah. Of course, half to, you know. Okay, listen. And you have that right. there. Look up. As you bury it. Adding very nicely to it. Yeah. I yeah, see I can it. see all the beans, kidney beans and... Tomato. Oh, tomato coming up. Oh. There you oh, see. Oh, fantastic. 
really is wonderful. I see how the juice of the chicken adds to the sauce already. And it's thickening very quickly. Completely. It's thickening yeah. and it's giving really a nice taste to, yeah. to everything. It looks so appetizing now. So we rerun again. We use the butter, then we use yes. chicken already chicken. cooked from a roast chicken. Completely. Chunks of chicken into yes. it. Then you start browning that. Yes. And then you add the Sauvignon Blanc. Salt, salt and pepper. Salt and pepper and Sauvignon on, Blanc. On uh, the chili powder. Oh, the chi no, but the chili comes uh, in after that. After, no, after the, the before the Do Sauvignon. Oh, yeah, well, you're yeah, very good. Of course, good. Oh, before the Sauvignon, would, the Sauvignon mixed everything. And it's very important to do it in that order. Yes, of course. Okay. See, I'm an Egypt. I wouldn't have known that. It's like I would have just thrown it in. Everything is like the life that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> harmony. <laughs> the harmony to everything. See, Pascal, you're 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 like a maestro here, conducting everything. I did not know that. So it's very important to do it in that order. Yes. Okay. Yes, really. Yeah, because if you do in different order, you will add the chili after. The chili might do some, uh, we say grumeau in English, uh, you know, the, um, some bits. Yes, congeal. Yes, congeal. Congealing. And of course, imagine if you okay. bite on the congealed chili, you will know all about yes, it. <laughs> you will uh, hurry up. <laughs> yeah, I see we'll be just running. To and the after. Local toilet. This is wonderful. And so we have it now just the nice boiled rice. Yeah, basmati rice. Basmati. Yeah, bo basmati boiled basmati. at home for 10 minutes. Yeah. On, yeah. Uh, That's lovely. That's it. On, you lovely will add that, yes. And you're just going to add that in now? Yes, yes. I would think we're probably here no more than five minutes at this stage. Exactly. It's almost ready. One second. Oh, that looks so wonderful. Et voilà. And, and Pascal, you know, this is Pascal Brissot's Shore Snacks. That's S-N-A-X, Snacks, because it's very fast, it's very easy. Yes. And you can literally have the stuff in your house already, the, the refrigerator, yeah. there's but no difficulty. I think there's a big difference. It's quite, it really like you eat at home. Yeah. It's yeah. nice to eat, it's hot and yes. easy to eat. And what do you call this? What is this now, this? But that is my famous chili con, con chicken. Con chicky. <laughs> chili, so this is Pascal's. Chili con chicken. Chili con chicken. He's making it up. It's as always chili con carne, no but that's a make-up job. I yeah, know. exactly. But it's wonderful. <laughs> chili con chicken. This is going to be great stuff. <laughs> I can see it now. New York signing publishing deals. Yeah, maybe Mexico. Mexico. <laughs> Who knows? Acapulco. Oh, we can go yeah. fishing by, we, by yeah. the way. Oh, definitely. Mexico. We have to fish mm. over there as well. Yeah. It's big fish. As well, you can see, it's all thickening up now, coming together. Exactly. That will be ready to sell now. Fantastic. Okay. So we're going to plate it up now. Oh yes. Take a plate for you. I can see the lads there. They're almost chomping on the bit eaters. Yes, it's just really. I can see them all. The sound. Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Oh okay. wow. Really, really ready for this. Looking forward to this all morning. Have you your paper toilet in the fridge? Eh, no. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> no, no. This looks terrific. Now. Oh, look at that. That's nice. Look That's good. plenty for me now because yeah. we've got a big crew here to feed up as well. All right. It's beautiful. You see some dessert. I can see it. No? But Pascal. Oh, it's fantastic. The tomatoey smell, the aroma. It's exactly. wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. There you are. Bon appetit. Um, isn't it a great job I have to try all of this as well, as well as going well, fishing? You have to be careful. Well, I have to be very careful, better. yeah. You will be welcome to the club soon. How do you feel that? <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. It's really it's nice. très, très bien. Bon, merci beaucoup. Really très bien. Merci beaucoup. You see, you can come fishing with us so any much, time. It's so, so good. I'm not going to give it to anyone. Okay, okay. keep it. Au revoir. Bye-bye, Han. Good fishing. Au revoir. Thank you and see you very soon. Bye bye. You're watching fishtalk.tv, the weekly online fishing show for all of us fish heads. Now I'm here in studio with Stuart Price. He's the fishery manager on the Mount Falcon Estates, the iconic River Moy in County Mayo. Stuart, I'm not much of a salmon angler. In fact, I know very little about salmon angling but you are an expert. Now for somebody who wants to get going in it, like myself, who's enthusiastic and wants to get going, how would we go about it and what would you recommend as basic stuff to buy? These days, I think it's, it's much easier. Cost-wise, uh, tackle manufacturers, it's almost difficult to buy a bad rod. You know, I recommend for anybody that's, that's starting out, you know, the fly fishing side for salmon, maybe a 10-foot single-handed rod, weight seven or eight seven or eight weight. that's okay. going to cover you for for the spate rivers and maybe a bit of lake fishing and then a double-handed somewhere 13 to 15 foot maybe slightly heavier weight maybe 10 rates something like that but the equipment as you know is much better these days oh, that's so unbelievable you really don't need to spend a fortune and a good starter kit if you take a double-handed rod um real line you're probably looking at maybe 400 euros something like that to get something that will that'll last you a little so this while this would be a quality outfit but not it, sort of at the top it's, end it, no it's 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 you know entry level if you yes, like yeah but but certainly 
perfectly good to use for, for some time. And almost more important now are the lines. You know, it, it's no good having a good rod if, if the line doesn't The line like is it. an important part of this. It, yeah, and the, the development in lines, yeah. uh, similar to and rods, Stuart, has been huge. you've got a, a range of flies here now. As I hold them up to the, the, to the viewers to have a look at these, can you tell me, like, how would you recommend, do you recommend somebody like me or somebody who wants to get going in this, goes and gets proper tuition, gets, or goes and stands Absolutely. beside a fellow I mean, and I, takes time at it? Know, I, I'm, I'm no instructor, if you like. I, I can uh, cast a line, not that prettily at times, <laughs> But uh, so the best thing to do is, is get qualified instruction and it, it will set you up very well, you know, particularly the double handed spade casting, because once you've learned the double handed spade casting, yeah. then you've got that for life. Uh, and it's so useful for yeah. a lot of the venues that we would fish, you know, not only on the Moya Mount Falcon. It's actually, I've but, tried it in Finland and I've tried it yeah. here. And I must say, once I got the momentum going yeah. and that smoothness and whatever, yeah. I actually got a sense of achievement. And, oh, yeah. and I really yeah. enjoyed it yeah. because we're t t to all intents and purposes, you're casting very light flies. You're loading this very large 14 foot rod mm. and getting that across a river. Isn't that correct? Yeah, it's it's about covering covering the lies, you know. On on we know from experience and on different rivers where the fish are lying, and so it's really you know you're casting effectively to, to cover yes. the lies, and that's the important thing really. Uh, and if people get good tuition and learn to, to cast properly, then the whole thing also becomes more enjoyable for them and becomes productive, doesn't it? Because that's you right. feel that you're actually yeah. doing it yeah. in the proper way. Yeah. And the, the key is that people enjoy it. Yeah, so yeah. if you're casting badly or you're struggling or you've got wrong matched equipment, then the whole thing's not going to be as, as no. enjoyable for you, really. Now, we have a range of flies yeah. here you brought along. This, I mean, looking at our own fishery on the Moy. You can hold up to that camera there, to the viewers. The orange and gold trim is probably our number one pattern. Orange on and fishery. gold. Yeah. Now, that's, that's a, a, a fly which is very much uh, just feather, Alan. You know, yeah. there's, there's, there's no uh, hair wing in there. So it pulsates. Yeah. It's quite soft. Yes. And it has good movement in the water. Yes. And that's a good coloration. Peat, it, peaty I, water. I'd imagine orange. it plumes as it moves through the water, does it? It, it almost pulsates. Yeah. You know. There's and another one down there. Look at that one there. Pulsate. Lovely colours. Yeah, that's that's the yellow, dirty yellow shrimp. It has a red head on it. Yeah, yeah. And these flies actually have been tied by uh, a very well known fly tie locally to us at Foxwood, Robert Gillespie. He's a, a, a an excellent yeah. fly tie, you know. Yeah something that I'm intrigued by because I'm a lure fisherman yeah. is the fly patterns and matching the fly to the water colour or the season or whatever. Absolutely. How do you do that as a salmon angler? Well, part of that becomes experience. So you know, for example, and the fish are very fresh in, orange is a very good colour for fresh fish. Yes. So the fish fresh in take orange very readily. Is that because they're feeding on shrimp at sea? Uh, it's difficult to exactly say that. As the season gets later on, you'll find that, for instance, this is a fohan shrimp. Fohan? Yeah. That, that's is that a more, the fawn that goes into the foil fishery? It is indeed. It is fairy, named okay. after the river. So, and that's an excellent pattern after the that's, fish have been in the river okay. or more at the back end. So, so you, have a lot, you have a lot of what I would call orange, that there's purple at the top, yeah. and a fade into sort of a bronzy colour. It's very yeah. attractive, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but it's, a, it's, it's. And then again, fresh fish, uh, very good. That's the uh, park shrimp. Uh, that one but there. that's also very soft tail. So there's what do you great call that movement. One again? It's a park shrimp. Park shrimp. Which was and what size is that now? Is that that's one? fairly small. There's, I think is you've probably got uh, 12, 12, I'd say. 12. 12 or a 14. 12, you know. 14 that but one we there. fish those in all different sizes depending on the time of year and the. the and I suppose the once, once that has been wetted in the water, there's a certain element of weight now is coming on it. So it probably enhances the castability. With modern rods and modern equipment, you can cast anything from a, a fly that weighs next to nothing really to some quite heavy. You know, if you were fishing in Scotland on some of the, the big rivers like the Tweed this time yes. of year, they'd be using some quite heavy stuff. Like what you length know? are we talking about? Three or four uh, inches? Yeah, you could be looking at three inch tubes that are brass tubes and things you almost, you'd want a crash helmet on, you know? Yeah, uh, uh, now I'm intrigued with this. Why would they use such big flies? Is it the big Just fish they're to after? Just to get down. Okay, you know, the, the flow of the water. Yeah, particularly this time of year, you know, they're still fishing till the end of November. So the, the rivers tend to be fairly swollen at this time. And a big target, I suppose, in a way, and maybe slightly stained, heavy stained Absolutely, water. Absolutely, yeah. So it's a bigger that. target for the but, fish to home in on. Yeah, but we would tend to use very much this type of fly throughout, you know, from May through to the end of the season for us. Occasionally, we use slightly larger versions when the water is just cleaning after a flood. You know, the, typically yes. you'll use a larger fly and then you'll scale down yes. as the water cleans and, and, and drops down, really. There's two flies there now. They are, they are beautifully patterned. 
But you, you are saying there that at parts of the season and the times, the at reading the water, reading this watercraft, that you That's determine right. as the angler, yeah. with your experience, which fly yeah. suits the, the, the different conditions, the different really. Conditions. Yeah, and different rivers. You know, there are, yeah. uh, we fish in, in Mayo, we have yeah. a, uh, a package where you could one day be on the Owen Duff, one day be on the RF, one day on the Moy. And certain flies will work on all of those. Certainly the orange and gold shrimp will work on all of them and so will the foghams. Okay. But there are one or two unique patterns to the different yeah. rivers, you know, okay. that work well. Now, um, Stuart is staying with us. He's our guest in the studio today. But earlier I caught up with a gentleman that I had fished with down in Uruguay and on the Amazon a couple of years ago. His name is Pat Brown from River Plate Outfitters and he runs an amazing operation down in the deepest, darkest part of the Amazon jungle. Patrick, a lot of people out there have read about the Amazon or might have seen it on a nature or wildlife program. But you, as an operator with your family, operating a fishing camp down in the heart of the Amazon rainforest, can you describe for our viewers what it's like, the scale of the place, and literally what you're going to expect on your arrival there? Well, first of all, let me locate you over there in Brazil. The Amazon goes, it's located in the uh, uh, north central of Brazil. It goes all the way from the coast, from the Atlantic, uh, ocean until all the way to the mountains of Peru and Venezuela, right? So first of all, whenever you go to the Amazon, the first thing you're going to notice is that you're going to catch a plane to Manaus. Manaus is the biggest city in the Amazon basin, would be the capital, if you want to say it in a way, the capital of the Amazon. From there, you will be landing and then you will be taking a floating plane to, the, to the, the river that you would be assigned to, right? River plate outfitters with fish, tributaries of the Madeira River and tributaries of the Negro River, which those two rivers are the main tributaries of the Amazon River. Now the Amazon River is considered to be one of the widest rivers in the world. So it's a very big river, really caudalous, you know, vo big volumes of water. And, and my, no. my, my recollection, Patrick, was for anyone just listening to you, which are very vividly painting a picture there, is the canopy of the rainforest. There's very little elevation. It's almost flat, most of the countryside, from my memory of it. But this enormous canopy, almost like broccoli florets, as far as the eye can see, as if you're imagining that greeny blue colouring of it. And, and the heat and the humidity was amazing. Exactly, exactly. As you, as you just said, it's it's very green and all surrounded by water and you could see it from the sky you could see big boats all of them coming back to manaus it's a you know typical typical big city you know jungle is big city and and when you your father chose the region he's in how did he go about dealing with setting up there that must have been a logistical nightmare because of the fact that you're so far removed from any human habitation, there might be some Aboriginal, the native people there, the Indians living along the riverbanks, subsistence living. But for you trying to set up a, like a tourism operation dealing with, say, first world clients, that must be a nightmare. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, first, you know, we started uh, with remote places. You know, we didn't deal with exclusivity that we're doing right now. And that's because at the moment, in, in the 90s, there, were, the, there wasn't competition at all. So we started with remote places, which it was not far away from, uh, from Manaus. But at the same time, you know, the fishing was good because no competition, meaning no fishing pressure, right? So with, uh, as, as the years came by, you know, you got all those different competitions that we have right now at the moment. And that's how we ended up getting exclusivity and working out concession with Indian communities. Yeah, and, and, and when I was there with you folks three years ago, the fishing was absolutely top drawer. And I remember there were five subspecies of peacock bass that we were catching. And what is the range of species we could actually experience if you're a visitor going to go on one of your trips? Well, you got, you know, you got, you got the different peacock, you got the butterfly, then you got, uh, um, you, you got the three, the three striped peacock bass, then you got the, uh, the speckled one. And these, Patrick, isn't it true to say that these are some of the toughest, hardest fighting predatory fish? 
pound for pound you're going to come up against. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. They will kill you the first the first 20 seconds, they will kill you, you know, they will kill you. And then you it's also a... have these um the red-tailed catfish that we hooked up into on a number of occasions, but we didn't have the proper gear or the, in fact the terminal tackle because we didn't cater f for that in our minds. We were going there after the peacock bass, but we hooked some huge catfish that we couldn't even control for about 10 minutes and they towed the boat all over the place. And oh, that was yeah. one of my memories that you never know what you're going to catch down there. Exactly, exactly. Actually, whenever you drop that lure, you never know what's going to come up from the bottom, you know. <laughs> we also went yeah. fishing one night to catch a load of um, the, the piranha and then your staff kindly made us up a piranha soup with the fish and it was an amazing experience but what I want to find out now is for people who want to get in touch with you Patrick and, and, and the business how do they get you online what is your web address please it's uh, our website it's riverplateoutfitters.com so, so that's riverplateoutfitters.com and Patrick Brown you're the general manager is it of the, of the entire operation right right exactly yes and Patrick, I can, I can attest to one thing, that if they go out with your family down there, it is an amazing experience. You're going to see most wonderful sights and sounds from the wildlife, from a cause. To, you'll see a sloth, perhaps. You might even hear or see the footprints of a jaguar. But the, the whole experience is such an exotic one and such a mind-blowing one that it's, it's something that if people have the resources to do it and indeed the time to do it, I would heartily recommend that they go on to riverplateoutfitters.com and contact Patrick Brown. Patrick, we will hopefully contact you throughout the season and follow you up on how things are progressing and maybe you'd let us know of some amazing catches coming off the Lazona fishery for Golden Dorado, but also in particular the Amazonian operations that you run. Patrick Brown, thank you so much for coming on fishtalk.tv. Thank you very much to you guys for coming. Well, what an amazing experience to go to South America and fish the iconic Amazon or indeed the Uruguay River at Salto Grande. Stuart, have you ever been down South America way? <laughs> no, I haven't been lucky enough to do that, Alan. It sounds uh, amazing, though. For well, something like you, very good on the fly rod, you'd have an amazing sport. Yeah, yeah, it sounds fantastic. Now, this week, you're going to do the book review. I am. You asked me to have a look, and I, I racked my brains. I, I didn't read a huge amount of, of books when I was young. I was too busy hopping over the fence to go off and fish on the Lambourn, you know? So, uh, but one of the books I was given when I was 12, 13, was actually uh, this book here, the Henry Williamson An Animal Sagas, okay. which includes Sailor of the Salmon, yes. which is, which is the, the one that That's I That's your read. topic yeah. tonight. Yeah. And who, give the author's name again. It's Henry Williamson. Hen Henry Williamson. It's, it's, yeah. a, it's a lovely book, I must say. I don't know if the it camera can see that. did have a nice there. cover Henry, at one time. Henry Williamson. Yeah. And it's 1935. Yeah, first published in 1935, Sailor of the Salmon. And it really looks at the, it's a, a fascinating book because it, it looks at it from the animal perspective, not just the salmon. I mean, sailor salmon in, in this is... To the five, eyes of sailor. Absolutely, a five-year-old yeah. fish that's returning to its native uh, Devon rivers. Um, and it, it, the first two chapters, the, the fish is still at sea. So it, it's, it's coming in, it's finding the scent of the... The river. The natal stream. Absolutely. It's talking about all the, the wildlife around it, the porpoises, which obviously is predators, and you know, it gets a lamprey attack and it's, talks yeah. about that. But it also further on it goes into looking at it from human perspective. So it talks about the, the netsmen and the fact that, you know, they're disgruntled the fact that they have a closed season and, yeah. and all this. So it, it's it's a It's a very big book. treatment of salmon and the journey and the perils. That Indeed, are, that the, the, are it does highlight the dangers. When you when you when you when you've read this, you'd be amazed that any ever survive. Really, when you think of the otters, again the the human poaching. It's and an netting incredible and journey. This yeah. this anadromous lifestyle, as I always break it down for people, it's a juvenile freshwater phase, adult sea going phase, and to go to Greenland and Faroe, yeah. it is an amazing odyssey. Oh. And to come back to their own river, then oh, tremendous, really, yeah, tremendous. And what it gives you, I think, if you certainly for me is an understanding and a respect of the, of the salmon. Yeah. And I think that's why I was encouraged to read it. An appreciation for the energy and effort that they expend yeah. getting back to their stream. Now, why did you choose that book today? Is it because it had a profound influence on you? Yes, I, as I say, it does give you an understanding. Uh, it's not an easy book to read. And he does actually say, if you read the end of it, it says it's not an easy book to read. It's, it's very detailed. Uh, and it does flit a little bit from the salmon's perspective, the human perspective, and back again. 
but certainly it's encapsulating in parts of it in terms of the nature and the whole ecosystem of the river, not, not just the salmon. Mm -hmm. So for me, it, it had an impression because it does give you that added respect for the fish. And I think his treatment of putting you also almost in this personalising of sailor yeah. and the journey and the perils of the sea, it actually gave, I would imagine, a young lad of 12 an amazing insight into this wonderful fish and probably made you say, I really want to try and catch one of these guys. Yes, I, I, and, and certainly I think the way that it deals with the rest of nature and uh, his, you know, in 1920s, 1930s, to have the information he had on, you know, he talks about when they get to spawning a par which is able to fertilise the eggs. A precocious male Absolutely, par yeah. can nip in yeah. and do the business. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he knew and that then. It, well, it seems so, yeah. He yeah. must have, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and his, no his knowledge also, I found, his knowledge of the fish going out to sea and feeding on herrings and all of that. It's quite amazing, given that we feel nowadays, I think, sonar yeah. and sampling at sea and all that the science of it, doing that we only learned about this in the last 20, 30 years. That's right. This yeah, man yeah. apparently knew this yeah. 75 years ago. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's well worth reading. It's hard work to read, but it, it's worth pers persevering, I think. Yeah. I'd, I'd recommend it to anybody that now, has where, an interest. Do you think that's available on Amazon? Or it is. If I, I looked, actually, I checked before I came, you? and uh, you can get it in a paperback, Sailor Salmon. I think about ten pounds or something That's like that. That's fantastic. 10 euros, yeah. And you would heartily recommend it. I, I would for anybody that has an interest, and for somebody to read it before they they start salmon fishing, I think it's a great thing because it does give an understanding and gives you that respect for the what is the, you know, the king of the river. And okay. Now Stuart is my guest in studio tonight. Stuart is the manager of the iconic fishery over the Mount Falcon Estates on the River Moy in the west of Ireland. So Stuart's my guest, as I say, he's staying with us. But I actually have a copy of that book. I didn't realise I had it. My wife gave it to me a number of years ago. And it's a 1935 second imprint. So I am saving, looking forward to reading that. Now, earlier on, I caught up with a gentleman that I've been in corresponding with for the last couple of years. And he's over in southern Australia. And he's a fabulous, world-class lure maker. Luke. You're famous over in South Australia. Chamo's Lures is your business. You make these wonderful handcrafted lures. What species of fish do you make the lures for? Well, g'day, Alan, and thanks for that question. To be honest, we don't really have a species target. We make anything and everything. If it's, we make anything from 20 mil, 10 mil, 15 mil lure up to a 250 mil cod lure that, that'll dive to nearly 10 metres. I mean, we, we don't really um, specify any particular target. I suppose freshwater species is my main passion, but um, yeah, we will target anything. If it takes a lure, we'll try and make one to catch it. And, and what it's type important. of wood do you work with out there? Well, we use... Um, Australian natives as much as I can. We use a um, hewn pine is hands down the best timber to make lures out of in the world. It, it's uh, waterproof straight off the bat. Um, it, it, it's, it's waterproof without even being um, coated with anything. Um, it's beautiful, smooth timber. It's uh, just a great finish. Um, to work with, to start off with. That's just a blank that we will paint later on um, tomorrow. Um, but we use cedars, um, a few Malaysian hardwoods here and there, not a lot, but a couple. Because I've got a joiner shop, a carpenter and joinery shop, I do a lot of joinery and furniture. So I've got a lot of offcuts and stuff like that. So um, yeah, we, but um, mainly Australian native timbers, hue and pine, cedars, red gum, uh, Australian oaks. That sounds wonderful. I noticed one or two. If you could hold them up slowly, each one to the camera, so that the viewers can get a look at them. Some of those would yeah. be ideal lures for trolling for the big ferox trout of these glacier lakes that are in Europe, and also for our northern pike. And I think the yeah. United States guys would be interested in, from the musky angling perspective, we do, some of your lures. We do. A little bit of interest from our uh, American cousins. Um, as you know, I sent some over to um, a few different people, wild fish, wild places, and the um, guys down in Florida, and uh, a few other mobs, and um, they've all caught bass and bits and pieces. This is one I painted up. That's beautiful. Literally. Yeah, that's a and lovely coloured lure. And, and would that run about five, yeah, six metres? Brown meters? and creams, for some reason, always work really well. They look really good. Um, Hand-cut diamond bibs, 
just for a different action. That'll go down to five metres, that lure. Big, loud rattles in them. Um, these are probably what gets us the most attention, is the ducks we do and galahs, um, which is a native parrot. That's wonderful. Um, Chamo, I was going to ask you that the finish on your lures, obviously, is, is the diving vein, is that made out of plastic, metal, or is it wood? Okay, well, some. These ones are um, chemical-resistant laminex, which is um, surprisingly strong and tough. But we put a... Um, what you would call a security type of clip that goes from the center of the bib back to the nose so if that fails it hooks up there or if that one fails it hooks up there so you've got to you've got to break two connections to um yeah and Luke that's on the real that's on the big stuff with the cod lures and that but um yeah here's, here's another duck we do we uh, very very popular very, very popular. Luke, we had to get a design protection. Yeah, Luke, one the of the end. big questions in my mind is always, what makes a good lure that's handcrafted versus a mass-produced lure from a big, well-known brand? Well, it's all about action. It's really about action. I mean, most people will, you know, they pick a lure because they like the colour. Simple as that. But we all in the lure game know that if they go any deeper than four metres, none of the colours mean nothing. Everything becomes greys, blacks, you know, dark blues, sort of stuff like that. You lose all the spectrums out of the colour range. So um, colour is, is a little bit overrated when it comes to... It depends how clear the water is, of course, but we're getting down to 10 metres deep. Well, you know, I mean, any any colour, as long as it gives a nice big silhouette. Here's something that we sort of, that's a little bit different. We 50 gram chasers done in um, rainbow trout colours. We hand tie each and every, um, we call them flash tails, but they're mallard duck feathers, parrot feathers and um, they white goose. Yeah, they, tru <laughs> they truly are Shamo works of art, I must say. And I, I think, how, how do our viewers get hold of you online? What is your web address? Well, you just go onto my Facebook page. We're still building our website. We're not the most computer, sav computer savvy lot down here. <laughs> well, speaking for myself. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, but um, go on to Chamo's Lures on the Facebook. And um, yeah, and then we just work it out from there. People so so our, 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 our viewers, Chamo, will go to Chamo's Lures on your Facebook page and they can get yep. a hold of you that way. I must say, oh, I'm looking I, forward yeah, to, I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to receiving some lures in the post because I'm gonna use them over here and hopefully we catch some monster pike and maybe a few big trout. Chamo, it's been yeah. wonderful talking to you. We'll hook up with you regularly throughout the year to see how you're getting on with the tournaments that you're involved in and to see how productive these lures that you make are really catching those big Murray cod. Chamo, thank you so much for coming on fishtalk.tv. No worries. Thanks for having me. All the best viewers and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, Luke Chamming's Chamo's Lures. What a fantastic craftsman. I mean, I'd love to get my hands on some of those bespoke lures and throw them at some of the pike around these areas. Now up next is Pixelated. That's the photo competition for all you folks. We've had a great response over the last four weeks and we actually have a winner. But before we get on to that now, send us in your entries for the next four weeks or the next four weeks and have a chance at some great tackle prizes. You can go through my line at fishtalk.tv or do, do it through Facebook. But if you don't send in your entries, you have no chance of being in to get a tackle prize. So the winner da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, of the last four weeks is Ben Caravasso for his wonderful photograph of a four and a half pound sea trout that he caught over near Sligo off the beach. What a lovely fish, but it's a beautifully proposed shot of a guy really happy with a glorious fish that he's just about to release back into the tide. So Ben, well done to you. You're going to have this winging its way towards you soon. A lovely fly reel and some other goodies to help you on your way to catch more of those gorgeous sea trout over in the west. Now Stuart, we're now going to talk about the fishery. The 
moi fishery that I have loved since I was a young boy. I actually caught a flounder when I was eight years of age, and I thought I was into a sea trout, a white trout as they call it locally. What a glorious place to work. It is fantastic, Alan. I'm, I'm very lucky. I've been there for nine seasons. Um, the Mount Falcon Estate comprises of the hotel uh, and also um, lodges that are in the grounds of the hotel. Yeah. Um, We're looking at some lovely photographs here yeah, now at the moment. Yeah, you can you can see the cell catering lodges there. They're great for the for the fishermen. You get three or four guys come or families come and they'll stay there. You can fit a fifteen foot double handed rod inside the door. You know, <laughs> think uh, of everything. Walk in with your waders. So so it's very good. But we have on the estate um, two miles of the River Moy, uh, which is split into two beats. The yeah. upper beat has beautiful our, there. Look at that photograph. That's, that is a picture of our upper beat. That's our fly water there. That's the famous Walpole. Uh, which can be, that's an early fish from the Walpole, maybe 2008, something that, like that. What's that, late June, is it? Uh, that's probably May, I think. May? May, May really? May, maybe May oh, or wow. something that's like great. that, nine, ten pound yeah. fish. So. That's a lovely fish. Yeah. And um, our fishing is split into two beats. The upper beat is, is the prime fly water and the lower beat is mainly bait and spinning. So there's a, there's a mixture of fishing for people. But you also are fishing on Beltra and a few other prime we spots. We do. No what, right. what we've done is we develop purely for the guys that only want to fly fish a package which we've called the Three Rivers package. And that means that you could, one day you could be on our water on the Moy, the next day you could be on the Owen Duff, which is a very wild, spectacular river to fish. Um, the Erif and also the lake, so you've got, round us we're very lucky, you've got Beltra Lake uh, for salmon and sea trout. Caramore. Uh, Caramore Lake in deep Bangor area is fantastic. Oh, Spring Lake, you know, yes. very good for, for salmon and then sea trout later on. Uh, and also Borough Shield, which is um, Newport Way, you know? You see, when I look at the Mount Falcon Estate, and I know the people behind it, you're fishing people catering to anglers. Yeah. So it's a unique relationship in that regard. You've thought out in advance that if the water is slightly off or conditions are not what they should be or you'd like them to be on the Moy, you can bring guests to different waters and give them a great opportunity. Yeah, we, we based it around really mayo. So you're fishing, you know, within an hour of us, you know. But also for people, it's great because one day you could be fishing the ridge pool in the centre of town. You probably know the ridge pool. Yeah. Um, and then another day you'll be out on somewhere like the Owen Duff, which hasn't changed for hundreds of years. And, and you're in real remote, it's, beautiful it's, countryside. It's wilderness. Oh, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, it, it's, it's a nice contrast. And then it, it gives them the nice package, you know. And you have folks there working with you that if I came along, not very proficient, but I want to learn, I can get classes, is that correct? Tutorials or whatever? Yeah, we'll arrange, you know, fly cast intuition for you. And indeed, you know, we, I have a resident gilly that works on our fishery who's also a very proficient caster, can help you, but help you with all methods of fishing as well. So it's not just the fly fishing, but the spinning and the bait fishing and so on um, that he can assist you with, you know? Well, I must say, I have to tell the folks now a little secret that they have a wonderful stocked lake on the grounds of the estate and for anyone trying to get to grips with fly casting it is a marvellous opportunity to get the rod out you're in safe hands with the guides over there and you can actually catch rainbow trout in this glorious setting and then get on the river and you get the rust out of the old system because yeah. you, you, you feel that you've now advanced to a certain degree of proficiency. The, the, the lake is fantastic for us yeah it, it's great to be used for the cast intuition get people into, you know, even playing a fish. If, if yeah. somebody hasn't had the experience of fishing, to actually have a fish on the fly and learn to let the fish and run. Manage and run it and whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, rather than being the first time is into a five, six pound salmon and, yeah. and panic sets yeah. out and then, you know. Now, tell me, Stuart, in relation to the numbers of fish, because it's a very prolific fishery, it's one of the great ones in Europe, what numbers on average a year would run through your fishery and well, will be caught on rod and line? In terms of, I, I've been there nine seasons, and the best we've done in that season, we've landed 1,069. That was in 2010, which was a very prolific grills rip year. Uh, and then our average now is around 700 fish a year. Now on that, the rod? That would be on the rod. Now, that is fantastic. It's a mixed method, so yes. quite a few of them would be spinning and maybe yeah. worm on the lower beat. But when the conditions yeah. are right, we'll make it fly only on but the But that's upper. 700, really probably from end of May, beginning of June, through the season. Would I be right in thinking that? You, you would be, yeah, indeed. So that's Alan. an amazing run of yeah. fish. I mean, most of our fish these days, are, the, the run's got slightly later, and we come into our own really these days from July onwards. Yeah. Um, so yeah. if people are coming to us a lot earlier than that, that's when, again, the three rivers would come into play. Yeah. So we'll put people on some... some now, what's the, the web page again for the folks out there? The, the, the best contact is... Uh, mountfalcon.com 
uh, and they can contact myself. I arrange the packages for people on my email, yeah. which is fisheries at mountfalcon.com. So that's fisheries at mountfalcon.com. And Stuart Price is our guest here, and you'll be dealing with Stuart if you have any inquiries and you want to come over, and it's a glorious place. I mean, spectacular setting. The cuisine is out of this world, but the fishing and the whole ambiance yeah. is it's a just... It's, 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 it's a lovely It's state. a lovely yeah. place, yeah. isn't it? very relaxing. People yeah. always say to me how, how enjoyable the whole experiences not just the fishing yeah. you know well now you're going to have a new experience that you're my guest here today <laughs> because now we're on to the section of the show that a lot of you folks have been writing into us about and telling us about your enjoyment of it's the fish talk challenge where we right. put our guests through their paces and i go on and bring it over to you and start the ball rolling stuart right i think i might need to put my glasses on for i think you now. might need to yeah. put a crash helmet on as well <laughs> so good. Right. So we've got a bay casting reel with 30 pound braid. You thread yeah. it through the center here of the level yeah. wind. 10 guides. Yes. You hold that there. I'll bring it back now over here. Out of the old creel, we have two items of tackle. We have the Dennis Pie dumbbell float that you thread mm, yeah. the braid through the guides, down through the center of that, yeah. through here, and yeah, tie it off. Tie. That looks fairly tricky now. Yeah. Now, yeah. Well, I'm just going to leave this over here. Yeah. Get our leaderboard in place. And this is. No, and you'll be able to see the great and the good of Irish angling. How, some, they're, how some, they're progressing. Somebody deliberately frayed the end of this one to make it, make it more difficult. <laughs> There's the great and the good there of Irish right. angling on that. Okay. Now, and I'm going to count you down a few minutes and we time it. So you can just familiarise yourself with the look of it all. And it's yep. braid, and braid, of course, is it's soft a little, and yes, malleable. It's a little bit more difficult to thread. It's, it's not as easy as mono yeah. or fluoro. I, I have used braid a bit, so I really shouldn't have any excuses, should I? No, you shouldn't have. So I'm going to three, two, one count down, okay. and then we see, can you displace any of these, the great and the good, on our leaderboard, who is now at the apex of it all. It's Carl Hughes on 1 minute 23. Pretty, pretty quick, I Bit of a challenge. So yeah. three, two, one, go. So Stuart Price, the fishery manager from the <laughs> iconic Mount Falcon estate on the River Boy in County Mayo, is now facing the Fish yeah, Talk yeah, Challenge. It isn't easy there, Stuart, That's is it? That's the hardest bit, That's I the think. hard yeah, bit there. Yeah. You're on your way. After that. It's 17 good. seconds. Yeah. On your way. No pressure, really. <laughs> but a man like you is dealing with fly lines, fly rods, all of that. Yeah. I'd say it's... Should be easy, shouldn't it? Meat and yeah. potatoes to you. It's easy enough, yeah. I'd imagine. You're doing very well. 34, 35 seconds. Yeah. I've done this before. That's one sure yeah. thing. 42 seconds. Going very well. Going very well. 47. You've done well. That's very, very appreciable, yeah? So you're on 54 seconds now through the Dennis Pie, who is a famous, as you know, Norfolk Broads pike angler. Oh, you're doing well. Ah, uh, you see, I thought that would... That I normally, thought of my too. Yeah, 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 normally that would uh, work on a float now. Didn't yeah. work there, yeah. did yeah. So Barry Darby was the one who brought it to my attention now. Clever he was with doing that. You're going up, yeah. 114, 115. You're true. This is very fast. And you lost a wee bit of time there with uh, going to the high dumbbell float. It's a very respectful time to go. Okay. One minute and 32. That is that is really, really, really good. I think, no, you lost a bit of time yourself, do you remember? Yeah, the dumbbell. Yeah. Because of the dumbbell. And I mm. think that actually was your undoing. Yeah. So let's see now where you are on things. You're actually third. Yeah. So that's that there for the moment. Mr. Le Hrissier is displaced for the moment. We've got Stuart Price. And bring them up that way. Yeah. So we've got Stuart Price, 132. And then we have Jeff Cooper, a 145. Then you've got Le Rissier next, Ken Whelan, Mick Flanagan, Burke, <laughs> Paul. You did very well. Great. You're, you're a you very good sport. Great fun. Thank you're you. Very good sport. And you being a fly angler and all that goes with it, I think is an advantage. And the course anglers use the course without here because the yeah, two yeah. boys. 
Yeah. We're very, very quick yeah. and very good. I think I could probably do it quick if I had another coat. <laughs> but listen, it's been a pleasure having you over. Yeah. I've wanted to meet you for some time now. Yeah. And we are going to come back in the spring and actually go fishing with you folks. Yeah, we look forward to that. And you're going to teach me roll cast. We'll, maybe we'll, the spay as well. We'll get that sorted for you. No so, problem. folks, it's been a very, very quick show as usual. The time flies when you're having fun, as they say. And so keep those letters coming in to us in all your notes. We would like to hear from you as your show, fishtalk.tv, was set up to hear from you guys. It's an interactive show. Send us in your messages. You can send them through Facebook or you indeed you can do it through YouTube. But info at, sorry, in fact, I'm wrong here. It's the new one we have. It's called My Line at fishtalk.tv is our new email. I'll repeat, my line, M-Y-L-I-N-E, my line at fishtalk.tv is our new email address, which you'll be able to send us in your comments, opinions, and all that's going on in your patch. So it's a very good night from me. It's a good night from Stuart here. Good it's night. a good night from Patrick Brown down in Uruguay and Chamo's Lures down in Southern Australia. So see you next Thursday night, same time on fishtalk.tv. Good fishing. <laughs>